It's time for another episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show, a podcast where I connect you with thought leaders from across the globe, dig into some of my favorite topics like personal development, marketing, spirituality, and pretty much any other shiny object that happens to catch my attention. Today, my special guest is David Meerman Scott, and we're going to be discussing his new book, The New Rules of Marketing PR. And this one has an epically long subtitle, but I'm going to read the whole thing because there's some important keywords in there. How to use content marketing, podcasting, social media, AI, live video, and news jacking to reach buyers directly. David, it's always a pleasure to speak with you. Welcome back to the show. Hey, it's great to be back. I'm glad I'm your shiny object for this <laughs> for this time. <laughs> I got to find at least five to 10 shiny objects to talk about on the podcast every month. So I'm glad you're one of the shiny objects for this month. Uh, it's been a couple of years since you were last on the show. So we've had a ton of growth since then. Uh, Going to go back to a place we were last time. And that's by asking you to share kind of that elevator pitch version of the David Meerman Scott origin story for somebody meeting you for the first time. Give them a little bit of context. What are a few things they should know about you? Sure. I uh, started, started on the bond trading desk, was terrible at it and hated it, but I loved the information that the bond traders used. So I spent 15 years in the real-time financial information business working for companies like Dow Jones and Thomson Reuters. I lived um, in Asia for 10 years, um, came back, started my own business, have written 12 books. Um, four of those books are international bestsellers. Um, the book with the very long subtitle that you just read, The New Rules of Marketing and PR, originally came out in 2007. And um, it was six months on the Business Week bestseller list. Um, it is now out in the eighth edition, which is kind of a remarkable thing. Um, and throughout the seven editions that have been published so far, um, it's it's sold um, nearly a half million copies and it's in 29 languages from Albanian to Vietnamese. Many people say that it's the most popular book about online marketing ever written. Yes, uh, each edition has been quite exhaustive. And I, I can say as a longtime marketing and PR guy, I learned something from every single uh, version of the book that has come out. Uh, I'm just curious, as a guy who works in publishing, what has it been like to steward a book through eight editions? Like most people get to maybe have a second, if they're lucky, a third edition. Anything that surprised you for getting to steward a, a project into new versions every few years? Well, what, what was really interesting to me is the audience that, um, re- that loves my book. So um, the first edition, I thought, was primarily going to be um, into the hands of people who work in corporates, um, PR people, marketing people. And yes, they definitely bought it and used it. And, um, and I, that was a good marketplace for me. But the two markets that were very surprising were entrepreneurs, um, solopreneurs, people who were running their own thing, authors, musicians, dentists, doctors, lawyers. Um, That was a market I was not expecting and became a huge audience for me and for the book. And the second audience, which was very surprising to me, was universities, um, the professors and instructors at universities. Um, The book is now used in. nearly 500 colleges and universities around the world as a core textbook um, for their online marketing and online public relations courses. And that was super surprising, Sean. You know, know, the reason for that is I never took a business course in my life. I don't have an MBA, never took a marketing course, never took a PR course. And here, this book that some interloper who never was properly trained happened to write and (laughs) ended up being the textbook that so many schools adopted. So that's, I mean, it was delightful, but a very big surprise to me. And I'm always curious also about, uh, in terms of how somebody chooses to open a book, I feel like authors are quite intentional about what, what sets the tone for the book. So for you, why that surfboard story? What about that story kind of illustrates the tone of where you want to go with this message? So, right. I wrote about a company called Grain Surfboards. I'm a huge fan of Grain Surfboards. They, they're a wooden surfboard company. And I'm a fan of them because they figured out that marketing for them is simply publishing great content. Marketing for them is not trying to have secrets, but sharing all kinds of cool things. They have a wonderful Instagram. Um, They um, have great content about wooden surfboards, how wooden surfboards are made. Um, And that then created the kind of content that people would find Um, who never had heard of grain surfboards, but were intrigued by the idea of a wooden surfboard and has turned them into the largest 
wooden surfboard company in the world. And they're, and it's not that they're a huge company. They're probably, I don't know, eight or 10 people, um, but they use the ideas in the new rules of marketing and PR, not that they sat down and read the book. They naturally gravitated to those ideas and it's um, allowed them to build a really big organization in a niche market that um, they were, were, were able to build without spending a single penny on any marketing and public relations. Because that's the, that's the ultimate of what the ideas in the new rules of marketing and PR are about and why I continually update now to the eighth edition, sort of getting back to your uh, part of your question before was, um, you know, universities are always looking for a fresh copyright date. Um, people who are up to speed with the latest um, tools and techniques want to know what's going on with those latest tools and techniques. So the seventh edition, you know, I didn't have anything about TikTok because TikTok wasn't big when I was writing the sec the seventh edition. But there's a section about TikTok in the eighth edition, and so on. Um, and uh, that idea of being able to create the kind of content for free. That allows you to grow your business, allows you to sell books, in my case, uh, allows grain surfboards to uh, crank out a whole bunch of wooden surfboards and have a ton of fans. That's what this, these ideas are all about. And I think one of the interesting changes we've seen from customers in the last couple of years is people are looking for organizations and brands that, they, that somehow uh, allows them to display uh, what's important to them, the things that they care about. So what we're looking, I feel like what we're looking for from the brands, the places we buy things, that has certainly changed. Uh, but also kind of on, on you know, the company side to how you relate to the customer. And again, I work in the publishing context. If you told me five years ago, I needed to worry about building direct relationships with my book buyers, I would have said, why do I need to care? People are going to go to Amazon. Maybe they want to go in person. They're going to go to Barnes and Noble. Uh, and now uh, I'm really concerned about having a one-to-one -one relationship with customers who buy from my store directly. I want to get everybody on my email list. And so all of a sudden, how people want to relate to us has shifted and the necessity of us having that third party out of the way where we're kind of doing life with our customers, that's very different than it was even three or four years ago. So why, why kind of that shift from both sides of the equation? I think in many ways, um, the middleman, um, middle person, <laughs> um, have, have become more powerful. And as a result, um, I think it's even more important to figure out how you're going to get the word out yourself, because all of us now are battling algorithms. So if you're selling your book through Amazon um, and uh, to a certain degree, other um, online booksellers, but Amazon in particular, because they're the behemoth, um, that's an algorithm driven kind of, of bookseller. Um, if you know you want to buy a certain book, you're fine. You just um, Google that or go to Amazon search engine and enter the title of the book. Bang, you get it. Bang, you buy it. You're done. But if you're looking for a book about a particular topic, if you're looking for a book about um, uh, electric guitars, for example, just to think of something, um, there's probably hundreds of books about electric guitars. How does how, do, how does it narrow down and point you to one of them? Well, it's all algorithm driven. And if you're not um, playing with the algorithm in the right way, your book isn't shown. doesn't matter how good it is. So what that means is you've got to figure out how to reach the buyers of a book about electric guitars before they go to the algorithm and, 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 and ask the algorithm for which book they should buy. And what that means is that you create content. You have a podcast about electric guitars. You write a blog about electric guitars. You have an Instagram about electric guitars. And then you become the expert, the recognized expert about electric guitars, which is exactly what Grain Surfboard did. They said, hey, we're in an incredible niche market. It's not only surfing. It's not only surfboards. It's wooden surfboards. That's a real big niche. But okay, so now people who are interested in surfing may gravitate towards being interested in wooden surfboards. People who surf, who are interested in being kind to the environment will say, oh, I'd rather ride a wooden surfboard because 
it's a more of sustainable kind of um, a material to make a board a, around other than the traditional materials of styrofoam and so on. Um, and, um, and then all of a sudden, you've built an audience in your Instagram, you've built an audience on your blog, you've built an audience on your TikTok channel, you've built an audience on your, on your, um, your YouTube channel, whatever you're doing, your podcast, like you're doing right now, Sean. And that is how people find your book. Because if they walk into one of the, you know, wonderful, I love them, independent bookstores, it's unlikely someone will hand sell them your book. Uh, if they go to Amazon, it's unlikely the algorithm is going to point them to your book. But what you can control is how people will find your expertise on social media, on the web, um, and in other places, because that will ultimately drive them to your book. And, and I'll say early on in my publishing career, uh, I was a senior publicist for quite a few years, and we sent out PR kits and press releases, and we'd mail out hundreds and hundreds of books trying to get interviews for our authors. Uh, how has that landscape changed in terms of putting things in front of media, reaching the media, getting coverage and attention? What are the newer rules? It feels like the things we did five to 10 years ago really fall flat these days. Well, one of the problems is that um, everybody in the media is just inundated with pitches from all kinds of different organizations and people and, and, and publishers and authors and you know, they just get hundreds, maybe even thousands of pitches a day. They can't possibly wade through them and they don't wade through them. Um, and so you're like, you know, you're, it's really, really difficult to make, an, make a dent using that way of trying to convince someone to write about what you're doing. There are a couple of ways that that can work. One is figuring out somebody who will publish part of your content, whether that's an original blog post you write or an original article you write or an excerpt of your book. So, you know, finding appropriate um, places that might take something from you. But the technique that I love the most is what I call newsjacking. And um, I think you're familiar with, with that concept and that phrase, Sean, but the idea um, is that um, newsjacking is what I call the art and science of injecting your ideas into a breaking news story. So people who are, uh, uh, we authors, people who are authors um, have a very particular area of expertise that we write and speak about. Like in my case, I write about online marketing. I speak about online marketing. I, I write and speak about how to develop fans of a business. Um, I write and speak about um, all aspects of strategic marketing. Those are my niches. And so the idea of newsjacking, which is a concept I invented, and it's now, by the way, so popular that it's, um, it's in the Oxford English Dictionary as a word, which I'm super proud of. I mean, how cool is it to have invented a marketing technique that's become so popular that it's, 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 it's a word uh, in, in the Oxford English Dictionary that references me as the creator of this, which is awesome. But so the idea of newsjacking is you follow what's going on in the news, and then you look for breaking news stories where you as an expert, you as an author, you as an expert about a, a particular part of that breaking news story can comment on it. And you comment in real time in either a blog post or um, or create a YouTube video or, or something. And I'll, let me give you a very specific example. So for the past couple of years, I've been very critical about the Facebook algorithm. I think it's incredibly destructive. I think the Facebook algorithm um, polarizes people. It pushes them into teams, whether that's the, in, in the United States, the red team versus the blue team, or the, the people who um, want to be vaccinated versus anti-vaccination people. And that's a very, very dangerous thing that Facebook does, which is create that polarization by, um, by rewarding content that makes people angry. And we could spend an entire podcast talking about the evils of the Facebook algorithm, but that's not what we'll do. Um, it's just to, to say that that's something that I have become a passionate, um, passionate about pointing out the negativities of the Facebook algorithm. 
So I've, I've blogged about that a whole bunch of times, written about it. It's in the, it's the, in the new book as well. And there's an entire chapter on newsjacking, by the way, in, in the eighth edition of the New Rules of Marketing and PR. So when there was a new book written um, about Facebook by a couple of, um, of, of news reporters who have been covering Facebook for many years, um, the book is the title of the book was, is called The Ugly Truth. And it came out about six months ago as we're recording this. And when that book came out, I'm like, wow, cool. There's a new book about Facebook. It's called The Ugly Truth. So they're probably going to get at the idea of the algorithms. So what I did was I pre-ordered that book. Um, and the day that it released, actually midnight of the day it released, it hit my Kindle because I pre-ordered it on my Kindle. And I immediately that morning started to read the book. I read all the sections about the algorithm. And I wrote a blog post very quickly. It was, it was that same day that the book released. And I did a book review about that book. And I said, hey, here's a, a book that um, is talking about the algorithms. Uh, I, I uh, appreciate it for these reasons. I then, I then left a review on the Amazon page of that book. And I, um, I wrote it as, you know, as my name, David Mirren Scott. And I said, hey, great book. Um, they talk about the algorithms in this way. I forget what everything I put in my review, but um, it became one of the most popular reviews of that book. I, I did a LinkedIn post. I did a tweet. Um, I, I basically, on the very first day that that book came out, I, as someone who wanted to be perceived as an expert in the Facebook algorithm, pushed out the idea that I know what I'm talking about around the Facebook algorithm in multiple ways in a breaking news story, the breaking news story being that here's a new book writ being written that was written by two New York Times reporters um, that's out today. My tweet was then commented on by the authors. And about two or three days later, I can't remember, it was very soon afterwards, I was contacted by a reporter from the Wall Street Journal who said, hey, we're doing a story about um, social media at work. We saw that you have written about social media. And I found out later that they, that they were referencing the fact that I had been talking about the, that book, The Ugly Truth, the day it came out. And so they uh, interviewed me and I was quoted in the Wall Street Journal. And then it also directly led to a speaking engagement. Um, so that's the idea. Now, in my case, it was a blog post. It was a review on Amazon. It was a tweet. It was a LinkedIn post, but the, as the aspect of being timely is what's critical. When a new story is breaking, that's when you need to get it out there. And anyone who's written a book is an expert. Anyone who's written a book is qualified to push themselves out there as a recognized expert. And when a breaking news story is happening, that's when your expertise is needed. So what this idea of newsjacking does is it completely twists the dynamic around from you saying to the media, hey, I'm really smart, please write about me, which never happens, to being, hey, here's a topic I know about, and the media is interested because there's a breaking story around it. Um, and every single one of us authors can do exactly that. And I, I think that one of the places I'd like to land as we move towards wrapping up is just kind of the the changing landscape of both audio and video content. I, you know, I'm a longtime podcaster for almost 10 years now. My heart's always with the audio. Uh, but like three, four years ago, I saw the need really to do video. So I do audio and video for almost everything. And now we've pivoted into this space where not only do you need to still do your long form, but in order to promote your long form content, you need micro audio and video content elsewhere. So the, the landscape is changing where we can reuse stuff that we're creating long form. Long form. We're also able to create you know, specific short form content. Um, I'd love to get your perspective on uh, the changing landscape, what kind of eyeballs or attention that's drawing. Because you know, a lot of us, our comfort zone is still doing the thing that we've always done, but you know, those things just aren't giving us the results that they used to. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of things to unpack in what's seemingly a simple question you asked, Sean, but actually has got a lot of complexities to it. The first thing I would say is that I think everyone is more likely to get results in the form of content they like the most. You know, I, I like to write. So I write a blog post every week. I, like, I write a LinkedIn article every week. I tweet almost every day. That's all written content. Um, and, you know, yeah, I do some videos now and then, um, 
I like to take pictures. So I've got a couple of Instagram feeds that I do, um, but I'm not really focused on that type of content. So the first thing I would suggest is don't beat yourself up thinking you have to do everything because nobody does everything. You know, I've, I've written a lot about TikTok. I don't have a TikTok. I've written a lot about the new audio um, social networks like Clubhouse. And I've, I've um, participated enough to know what I'm talking about, but I don't love it. So I don't do it often. Don't beat yourself up about not participating in all those social media. You simply can't. And I believe it's better to focus on a few than try to spread yourself too thin. The second thing, and you you alluded to this, is repurpose, repurpose, repurpose. I mean, create something once, use it many times. Um, I'm a huge fan of figuring out ways that you can take something that either you've already created um, and turn it into content or, um, um, or in other ways, um, create um, something new from something that already exists. And there's actually some interesting AI tools that you can use to do that. Um, There's a tool that I use all the time called Lately AI. Lately AI. And I've, um, full disclosure, I love this tool so much that I became an advisor and an investor of the company. That's how much I love it. I was like, did it, I was given a demo. I'm like, wow, this is cool. I want to buy the product number one, but I want to invest in your company and, and advise you number two. So I, now I'm an advisor to Kate, the CEO of the company. But what Lately does is um, you can drop a long form text video or audio into the AI engine and it creates short form content that's ready to be posted on social. So I can literally take a chapter of a book that's maybe, I don't know, call it 5,000 words, drop it into the AI engine, and then within a couple of minutes, it has generated 100 tweets for me. Now, I, I want to edit the tweets, make sure they're all appropriate, and some of them I might delete, a few of them I might actually edit, but I might end up with 75 tweets. And then within lately, I can then schedule them to go out one per day for the next 75 days. That entire process takes probably 20 minutes. And um, with something I've already written, the chapter of a book, I have now created a tweet a day for 75 days. And so that's that's the idea of repurposing in this case using AI. But um, but I'm a huge fan of repurposing. So those are my those are the two thoughts. Don't think you have to do everything because you can't. And if you try to, you will spread yourself too thin. And number two, repurpose and maybe look for tools that will help you to repurpose. And in terms of the the reader's journey with the book, uh, you cover a lot of ground. Uh, what are a couple of ways people could approach it? If somebody's already like really dialed in in some areas, can they jump to the areas that they need to work on? Do you feel like it'd be better to like go all the way straight through and kind of build on on what they're what you're reading? Uh, how would you like readers to approach it? I actually wrote the book in a very conversational tone, just like we're talking here. You know, if you were to, if you were to make a transcript of our conversation here, that that would be much like what how the book is written. And I, I absolutely designed it on a chapter by chapter basis so that you can pick and choose the chapters that make sense and uh, jump around appropriately. I, I kind of wish. That it was written like like um, in in HTML, so that there are hyperlinks that linked you from one part of the book to the other. And alas, in a print book, that's not possible, and in a Kindle book, it's not possible. So, or, or sorry, an ebook, it's not really possible to do that well. So, um, absolutely, you know, it's a um, it's got a lot of content in it. It's a college. It's it's used in colleges as a textbook. It's it's nearly five hundred pages, but most people would probably read. The, only the things that are important to them. And some of the newer chapters that I think are super interesting and super important that anybody can get something out of is the newsjacking chapter. And we talked about newsjacking, the, the AI chapter, how to use AI in marketing. Um, those are two areas in particular. Uh, I've also, the social media chapters, two social media chapters are important because I cover new social media, like we already talked about audio, like Clubhouse, and um, and TikTok and other other sorts of new social media that you need to be aware of. Um, so some people read it straight through, and God bless them. But um, um, others, um, uh, it's just fine to pick and choose the chapters that are most important. And David, in terms of people connecting with you, finding out more about your work, finding out more about your books, where do we discover you on the web? 
So I use my middle name, Meerman, M-E-E-R-M-A-N, because there are so many David Scotts out there in the world. I, I, Sean, I don't think you have the same problem I do, but I have a very big search engine problem when, with my name, which is David Scott. So more than 20 years ago, I became David Meerman Scott using my middle name professionally, and I am the only David Meerman Scott in the entire world. So the, the Google machine will bring up me and only me davidmearmanscott.com if you want to go there directly. And on most social media, I am DM Scott, D-M-S-C-O-T-T. And like we do with every episode, we'll make it easy. We'll have links to David's website, as well as links to places where you can pick up your very own copy of his brand new book. It's time to bring this episode of the Sean Tabbitt Show to a close. Many thanks for being a part of my conversation with David Meerman Scott. Once again, our book today was The New Rules of Marketing and PR, How to Use Content Marketing, Podcasting, Social Media, AI, live video, and newsjacking to reach buyers directly. And David, I want to say thank you so much for sharing with us today. It's been an honor and a pleasure to have you back on the show. Thank you. I love coming back for my, uh, my, my, my multiple round here. I really appreciate you having me on.